Well, hello, everybody. My name is Pastor Mercury Bynum. I pastor Limitless Church Dallas in the great city of Dallas, uh, Texas. So excited that you chose to join us today. Uh, now, in just a few moments, we're getting ready to take you on a journey uh, to learn about the ancient Hebrews. Uh, this lecture series uh, that we've uh, done here at Limitless Church that's going to help us understand who the ancient Hebrews uh, were, um, what they looked like, um, how they migrated uh, away from Jerusalem. Um, this is some exciting stuff. And so um, I want you to get your popcorn ready. Uh, tell a friend, invite a neighbor uh, as we get ready to take you on this journey. Now, uh, some might say this is a controversial topic. Some might say that, that uh, it's not rooted in biblical fact. But on the contrary, uh, the Bible supports uh, throughout the Bible um, what you're getting ready to see. Uh, not only that, um, history supports, literature supports, art supports um, what you're getting ready to see. And so we're excited to bring it to you. Um, one of our associate pastors, Lewis Palmer, is getting ready to take you on this journey. Uh, hope your seatbelts and enjoy. God bless. <laughs> demonstrate uh, where the um, cradle of humanity, cradle of civilization is in the earth. Uh, we may even uh, touch upon where Eden is, um, what Eden is. Um, a, lot, a lot of us think that the name of the garden was Eden, but the garden's name was not Eden. Eden was the region where the garden resided. Um, anyway, we'll talk about all that as we go along tonight. If you do have your Bibles, we're going to open up with just a few scriptures. Um, one of the things that's very important uh, that the Bible talks about is being able to prove what you believe. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 1, uh, Luke, who is the author of, of Acts, writes, he says, the former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus? of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so Jesus demonstrated his authority by many infallible proofs, it says here in the book of Acts. In 2 Timothy, Paul writing to a young pastor, Timothy, he tells him uh, verse in chapter four, verse five, but watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Again, proof, uh, that is to say, to, to demonstrate by evidence, that uh, what you say and speak and do is the truth. Again, in Romans chapter 12, verse one, we read, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, why is that, Paul? that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, proof. We have a responsibility as believers to prove what we believe. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
uh, starting in verse 18, Paul says, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. In verse 21, he says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he said, prove all things. And so tonight, um, I intend by the help of the Holy Spirit to prove to you that Eden exists. It exists on the continent of Africa, that humanity was birthed out of Africa and uh, language itself was birthed out of Africa, okay? All right, so let's begin. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In verse 26, the scripture says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God in verse 20 in chapter Genesis 1 27 created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28 and God blessed them and God said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. When God created the first man and woman, he created that man, the scripture says, in their image. God being plural, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. He says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so one of the things that's interesting about he did in our modern vernacular, we think of him. Right now. Hey, uh, Cornbread, can you mute your, mute your phone? I got you. I got you. So one of the things that, that, we, that we, uh, we think of the words image and likeness as being synonymous. But it's interesting that the, the Holy Spirit uses both image and likeness here to describe how God made man. Image has to do with Adam's appearance, okay? Likeness has to do with Adam's power. Image has to do with Adam's appearance. Likeness has to do with his power. It's very interesting as we read and consider this text that God spends his time in verses 26 through 28 in Genesis 1, talking about the likeness that Adam had being represented by that dominion that he gave him. So God gave Adam dominion, which is characterized after his own likeness and in our image. So uh, verse 20, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter two, starting in verse six, um, let me pause for just a second. Angela, did you get a hold of Miss Wanda? Yes, she says she was trying to, um, she was going to be logging in short in a minute. Okay, because she's she's calling me. Do you mind giving her a call and helping her log in? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Genesis chapter two. Uh, verse six says, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the. Hey, Calandria. Hey, I think Tanika got locked out. I don't know. Oh, happened. she's back in. Okay. She just not her I'm video's sorry. not on. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're good. I just saw the flailing arms. I didn't know if something was happening. If you were shooting a mosquito or. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, again, Genesis two, verse seven. 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Okay, some observations about Genesis 2, uh, verses 6 and 7. First observation is that the, the ground was watered from beneath. Okay, this is going to be important because of the second observation is that God formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, when I think of dust, I'm from a country uh, road, I live off country road in Arkansas. Uh, we had five miles of country road before we ever saw any pavement. So I know what dust is. But I don't know if that's what God is talking about when he says dust here in this passage of scripture. Okay, and I'm going to give you some other verses to consider about this term dust. So Isaiah 40, verse 12, the scripture reads. The scripture reads, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hands and meted out heavens with the span. I'm sorry, excuse me, meted out the heaven uh, with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scale and the hills and a balance. Again, another passage of scripture in Proverbs 8, uh, verse 26. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. So I think based on these passages of scripture that you can consider dust another word for dirt. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Anyone have any objections to dust being dirt? I want to show you something here. What was the Isaiah scripture, Elder? Isaiah 40, just a second. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Uh, when you think of ordinary, common, um, the way we understand dust, dust sort of flies up in the air and then dissipates, right? But whatever dust is here, it's heavy enough to be measured. And there's a lot of it, and it covers the whole ground. Um, and then dust has uh, can be measured also not only in weight, but also in height. So again, dust is dirt. So God reached down in dirt and formed man. So I wondered what that word dirt, uh, dust there in the Hebrew meant. And I'm going to share this with you, and hopefully you can see this. Okay. Can y'all see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let me back up. All right. It says that man was formed from this, the dust. If y'all can see that, it is this Hebrew word, a pair. I'm not going to, I, my Hebrew isn't very good, so don't hold that against me. Um, and then when it's the strong 6083, and as you, and I'm using biblehub.com, by the way, if no one's ever used this before for your studying, Bible Hub is amazing. You have all kinds of Bible versions, plus in linear, and you can do cool stuff like this here. So one of the definitions of that word, uh, one of the definitions of that word, we understand to be powder or anything pulverizing, but one of the definitions is right here. Can y'all see that highlighted there? Yeah. Mortar. So one of the definitions of the Greek, of the Hebrew word is mortar. We know what mortar is. We use it to put bricks together or we put plaster in a house, mortar, but you can take mortar and shape it into something statues or in this case a man okay 
So I just wanted to just give some clarity around dust and dirt. And uh, because I have a question, not part of the lesson, but just a thought. Um, in your best estimation, whenever you have seen dirt, what color was it? Just a, just a question, just, just a question. Whenever you've seen dirt, what color was the dirt? That's, that's not part of the lesson. Like brown or reddish? Red, kind of black. brown. Okay, red, Tanika, you yeah. said. Jerry, you said red uh, and brown. Interesting, I did not know this until uh, preparing this lesson, that the word Adam means red. I did not know that. So the yeah. Hebrew word for Adam means red. Man of red earth. Too, yep. You know. Say again. Yellow dirt. Yellow dirt. Mm -hmm. Man of red earth is what the definition is. Yeah. Yes, sir. There you go. There you go. All right. So where on earth was Eden? The Smithsonian Magazine, in an article entitled How Africa Became the Cradle of Humankind, was anyone, did, did anyone not know that the cradle of humanity was in Africa? Did you know why, did you know why you, okay, so a few I didn't of you didn't know. know. Days. Okay, for those of you who knew, did you know why you knew that? Did it just sound cool to say that man that humanity began in Africa because we're black or brown? Um, I I'd heard that before, uh, but in doing this lesson, I sought to prove that it was not true. Okay. So, in an article entitled "How Africa Became the Cradle uh, of Humankind," a fossil discovered in 1924 revolutionized the search for human ancestors. Leading scientists to Africa, 1924. Who knew that? In 1924. If you know anything about human evolution, the article says, it's, prob it's probably that humans arose in Africa. This is from the Smithsonian. I, I had no idea they had those, they, they held that opinion. It is... Uh, it, it goes on to say that, but you may not know how scientists came to that conclusion, all right? That's the Smithsonian. And another scientific journal called uh, phys.org or physics.org, uh, the title reads, the whole of Africa was the cradle of humankind, okay? It says, for a long time, East Africa has been considered the place of origin of the earliest hominins and lithic technology. Hominins are human, human types. And I believe that lithic technology has, speaks of language. So it says that both life and language originated in Africa. Okay. That is phys.org. I'll, I'll share these links. I'll put all this stuff on the, on the group. So it'll be available uh, whenever you talk to your... Uh, have this conversation with others. Anybody have any questions about, about this so far? Everything good? Y'all tracking? Awesome. All right, so for the next few, I'm going to quote some, I'm going to quote from a book at, entitled, uh, I think I can show you the cover. Um, it's a book entitled Eden. Um, bear with me. The Biblical Garden Discovered in East Africa by an anthropologist named Gert Mueller. Um, I lost my meeting. Here we go. Okay, y'all see that? That's the cover. Anyone's interested in the book? So Gert in this book, uh, it's a short-ish read. Gert is an anthropologist and he uses a lot of scientific jargon and he gets real deep into science. Uh, but there's a few things I wanna point out 
of this uh, that he's written about Eden. Uh, two characteristics of the oldest skeletal remains from Europe and Asia had been known for decades. The skulls displayed the highest incidence of features reminiscent of sub-Saharan Africans among Stone Age skulls from those continents. Also, the skeletons had a ratio of shin bone, tibia, to thigh bone, femur, and a forearm bone, radius, to upper arm bone, humerus, that was closer to those of sub-Saharan Africans than those of modern Europeans or Asians. These ratios are known as the cruel and brachial indices, respectively. This strongly suggests a scenario where sub-Saharan Africans were the first Europeans and Asians many tens of thousands of years ago, which in turn suggests Europe and Asia, uh, Europe and Asia were peopled from Africa. So the first Europeans, the first Asians, were from Africa. That's uh, Gert Mueller's book in the first chapter, Origins of Humanity. Uh, excuse me, Origins of Humanity According to Science. He goes on to say, um, Analysis of human mtDNA showed that women of European and Asian descent had similar mtDNA within their own groups, but women of African descent had diverse mtDNA within their own group. This suggests that the mtDNA lineage of Sub-Saharan Africa were older than those of Europe and Asia, meaning the first woman whom they call mitochondrial Eve, lived there. She is thought to have lived in, sub, in Southern or East Africa. Her modern representatives would be the Khoisan people of East and Southern Africa. DNA is also found in the nucleus of cells. This nuclear DNA was much more difficult to use to trace ancestry because of chromosomal crossover. There are small sequences of DNA combinations called haplotypes. Some haplo haplotypes can be used to trace ancestry because they're less effective uh, by chromosomal crossover. Those that are as old as modern humanity and have been investigated show how much diversity in Sub-Saharan Africa and less in Europe and Asia, just like the mtDNA. So in other words, what he's saying is, as they study down to the cellular level of bones and uh, fossils, the record indicates that that all stems from, comes from Africa, regardless of what continent it's found on. Y'all good? Any questions? What do y'all think um, about that? Um, so the, this was, this was funny. I don't know if I told Calandria, maybe I told someone else. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Pretty, yeah. Okay. Um, what was funny is that last week I was on a, a leadership call and one of, um, so in our leadership meeting, people have, have done the 23 and me, you know, the different, um, ancestry, um, tests. And one of, uh, the leaders, one of the managers was saying he got back his results and he was, Irish, uh, and then he got back to, got down to the bottom. He said, um, and I'm 2% Nigerian. And he, and he even made a comment. He said, that's where we all come from anyway. I thought <laughs> it, 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 it floored me because if you know him, that was unexpected. Oh, wow. The part of the conversation was like, hey, that's where we know that's where we come from. And a lot of um, European people, or let's say Irish or whatever, when they get back those results, they're able to see whether it be 1%, 2%, 3%, that it ties them back to Africa. So that was just a comment. I thought it, it floored me when he said it, like in the rest, like, yeah, we, we kind of already know that. <laughs> right. So that was, that was kind of cool. So let's talk a little bit more about um, 
Let me a second to catch up with my notes. Oh, let me let me read one more quote uh, about about language. In the 1990s study, studies appeared which observed that linguistic diversity of structural features in a region increased with time. In some regions of the world, there was more diversity of this kind than in others. A few regions such as Africa and New Guinea were regions of very high linguistic diversity. It was concluded on this basis that Africa was where human language originated and spread out to the rest of the world. The study found that languages with the most sound were found in Africa and that as one moved away from Africa, the number of sounds and language became smaller. The phonologies of the language became simpler. It was concluded on this basis that human language originated in Africa and spread out to the rest of the world, reaching the Americas last. So I know that in modern science, there's this idea of evolution, right? That we all evolved from apes. And to a large degree, I don't argue with them about, uh, about the uh, evolving from apes that is evolutionist. Not that I believe we evolved from apes because I know we didn't, but I don't argue with them because they have to, they have to on one hand, admit that something had to create the ape. And if they want to say it was uh, aliens or they want to say it was whatever, I don't care. They got to go all the way back to something because they know in their minds that something cannot come from nothing. Well, the largest population of apes and those, that type of Mars, uh, that type of uh, mammal is in Eastern Africa. So the second thing they have to admit is that if man evolved from apes, is that man had to originate in Africa. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this is um, devil's advocate. Go ahead. All right. So there is, um, even in theological circle, circles, there is this debate as to when we talk about Adam, we just focus on Adam for a second. Um, when did Adam uh, live, right? Um, if you look at scripture, we're talking about um, about 6,000 years ago, um, yeah. somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Now, however, if we look at the science of carbon dating, a matter of fact, recently I have an article I haven't sent it to you, Lewis, where they found in Africa the oldest, um, two weeks ago, uh, the oldest baby burial site. And it's dated at, baby was three years old, two and a half to three years old. Dropped by an eagle. No, no, no. And the carbon dating dates it at 78,000 years ago. Okay. 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 And so it's the oldest human burial in Africa. I have no dispute that Africa was the birthplace of mankind. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I think there is a uh, uh, good grief. The word I'm looking for when the continents, for the continent split, what, what, what's the, the, you saw the map before all the yeah. continents split. Yeah, Pangea. Uh, Pangea. Um, so I have no doubt of that. I think where when we present this, when we package this, you have some individuals that are going to be on both sides. Biblically, the Bible says that Adam was created about 6,000 years ago. Yeah. Science is going to take man back to about uh, 128,000 years ago. At a minute. Um, at a minimum so just something to kind of just something to kind of oh I, uh, I have an answer for you uh, go ahead uh, yeah so um that's a classic that's a classic argument uh evolution against the bible and while man was put on the earth about six thousand years ago uh, 
one, that does not mean that the earth is 6,000 years old. I think there, I think it can be demonstrated that the earth is much older than 6,000 years. And what we see in Genesis 1-1 is not the original creation of earth. In fact, uh, Genesis 1-1, if you want to say that is the original creation, that's fine. But certainly Genesis 1-2 demonstrates that whatever state the earth was in was not in a created, it was not in a perfectly created state. Right, so it was, it was in a it was in a it was in a state of without form and void. So something right. must have happened to the earth between Genesis one one and Genesis one two. All right. The other thing to bear in mind is that the Bible demonstrates that there was civilizations of humanoid type people on the earth that that predate Adam. So in places like Jeremiah chapter four verse twenty. Uh, other places in Isaiah, it talks about how uh, how this world was ruled by none other than Lucifer, and Lucifer occupied this place called Earth, <clears throat> and Lucifer sinned. So when you read it in Isaiah, where he says, "I will" five times, one of the things he says is, "I will ascend," which must suggest he's below heaven. I will ascend to heaven. I will be like the most high. So wherever he is in reference to the most high, he is below him, which suggests that he is on earth. God judged the earth, destroyed the uh, destroyed everything that was on earth at the time to include taking out the sun, moon, and the stars, instant freeze. And now you have a state of the earth and you have the earth in a state of without form and void. So the Bible does not, or, or, or science does not shake the Bible. And so when, 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 the, when the scientist wants to say, oh, your Bible's inconsistent with science. Say, no, 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 my Bible's very consistent with science. Your science is inconsistent with the Bible. My Bible testifies that the earth could have been here for a long time, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Who knows? So, what? yes, sir. Um, to that, to your point about uh, Genesis one, uh, one and two, the word, um, the word was there in verse two is actually mistranslated. It comes from the original word means became as is became. Okay. So the original Hebrew word it says the earth became without form and void. I believe okay. the word is high. It's the Hebrew word high. I believe. And that's uh, a great. I'll point. look it up. No, um, so yeah. so there was a process there between there was definitely a process there between verses one and two, according to, to the original word. Yeah, very good. Thank you for, for bringing that out. Now let me let, let me just say this in six and section eleven. I believe that Adam, that man was created six thousand years ago. I believe what the Bible says. Right. Now I believe that um, as Lewis said, it's a misinterpretation of the science. I do believe that. Um, that um, you know, when they, because in man's mind, they, they've tried to replicate or, um, you know, some type of cre uh, a creation or some type of, they tried to figure out how did this stuff happen? Right. right. And, and we know how it happened. And God said, it. God said it, right. <laughs> and, and God said, it. and God said, it. but in man's mind, it's like, okay, now, all right, so let's assume God didn't say, so how would these things come together and how would all this stuff happen? Right. Based upon our science, we feel as if it would take 128,000 years, it would take this and the other. So um, in this instance, science does not support the Bible, right? right? But I, I firmly believe what the Bible says, um, that Adam, that man was created, first man, was created about 6,000 years, 6, years ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I don't know that, and I don't know that we necessarily um, have to get into the weeds with the other stuff, but we should be prepared to answer, to Absolutely. respond to the other stuff as it comes. Right. right. And uh, I didn't include that. I'm just taking some notes for myself. I'll give you the passages in the, on the, the group that show you that there were, that was life here on earth before Adam. I'd be glad to show you that. Jeremiah 4, 20, I think is where it is, but and others, but I'll get that for you.
Okay. Great questions. Anybody else have any other questions before we move on? All right. Why aren't you working? Okay, it's 7.45. Um, I'm going to read another, that's what I'm looking for. I'm going to read another uh, portion here, and then I want to, I want to show you a map. So uh, again, in uh, Gert Mueller's book, uh, Eden, the Biblical Garden Discovered in East Africa, uh, the classical author Theodorus relates of human uh, relates a version of human origins uh, that he learned from the Ethiopians of south uh, to the south of Egypt. According to this version, the region uh, excuse me. Uh, according to this version, the region of ah, there's something I can't see. There we go. Uh, and let me get back to where I was. Thank you guys for your patience. According to this version, the region of, of the historical famous Kush is where human is where the human story began. The, the historically famous Kush. <laughs> you know who Kush is, right? Kush is one of Ham's sons. Ham had four sons. Kush put Mizraim. Put Kush <laughs> Mizraim. Oh my goodness, I always do that. Hold on. He had four boys. I'll get you the fourth boy's name in a second. <laughs> but Kush is one of them. Uh, now the Ethiopians as J Peth. No, J Peth was one of Noah's boys, not him. Oh, sorry. It's all good. Now the Ethiop uh, now the Ethiopians, as history relates, were the first of all men, and proofs of this statement, they say, are manifest. For that they did not come into their land as immigrants from abroad, but were natives of it, and so justly bear the name autothons, that is, sprung from the soil. Sprung from the soil. Is uh, they maintain conceded by practically all men. Furthermore, those that dwell beneath the noonday sun were, in all likelihood, the first to be generated by the earth is clear to all since in as much as it was the warmth of the sun which at the generation of the universe dried up the earth when it was still wet and impregnated it with life it is reasonable to suppose the region which was nearest the sun was the first to bring forth living creatures now this is a book written by uh, Diodorus Siculus in the library of history okay Okay, so um, so uh, this author is not a Christian, but I want you to pay attention to what he said. He said that the Ethiopians say that they sprung from the soil when it was still wet and the earth warmed it and thus produced life. Does that sound a little familiar? How about Genesis 2, 7, 2, 6 and 7, where it says a mist came up from the ground and watered the earth. We know that the Hebrew word apara uh, has as one of its definitions mortar, which is a soft, moist material used to make stuff. This man documents that Ethiopians, that is Cushites, said that they were birthed from the soil. In the Genesis account, God breathed life into watered ground, right? I'm just gonna show you the similarities. Uh, God formed man, that is Adam, from the dust of the ground in the neighborhood of Cush near Havilah, all right? In Diodorus's account, the sun impregnated with life by drying up the earth when it was still wet. The sun, therefore, causes Ethiopians, the first of all men, to spring from the soil in a region of Ethiopia beneath the noonday sun. Uh, and I... When I think, when we think of Ethiopia in modern times, in modern times, we think of a little tiny place on this big old giant continent of Africa, 
little tiny place, but I want to show you a map. Mm -hmm. There we go. I'm going to show you a map that will demonstrate that Ethiopia was actually much larger than that. That's, I'll start with this one. Okay, can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So in this map, Ethiopia takes up, let me see if I can make it smaller. In this map, Ethiopia takes up the majority of Central Africa all the way down to South Africa, okay? Mm -hmm. There's another map where Ethiopia, I, um, I'll just bear with me, it's 751. Um, I am prepared to stop at eight o'clock. You can go over for, uh, that's my vote, but it's okay. up to the people. I'll probably need to wrap this up about 10 minutes. Are y'all good with 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. What's the date of this map, Lewis? Uh, I, I, I will give you uh, the date in a little bit. I don't have it right off hand. I got all of these maps off of Princeton University's website. I'll send the link so you can get these maps for yourself. Uh, but they're out there on Princeton University's uh, website. The other map is, bear with me. I have far too many windows open. Ah, that's the one I want. Okay, so as you look, let me make it larger. As you look at this map, you see something called Upper Ethiopia, right? And then you have over here, this section over here called Lower Ethiopia. Upper, that goes again from center all the way down to South Africa, and then lower Ethiopia. I have a theory about why it's called upper and lower. Uh, has nothing to do with what our, our lesson is about, uh, but um, imagine if you look, if the perspective was from the pole star and you're looking out across the earth and maybe it's a plane and it's not a ball. And then from that perspective, upper and then lower Africa, just a thought. All right. But my point is, is that the Kushite empire was the majority of Africa. It is no wonder then that Ham's grandson was named uh, Nimrod, who was the son of Kush was the first world leader. So when you think about a world leader, not a president of the United States, not a president of Russia or wherever, Nimrod was the first world leader. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says that he united, the whole world had one language and he caused everybody to join together and to build tower, okay? That's a world leader. The known population of humanity helped to build a tower that could reach the heaven, and God had to put the brakes on that and say, listen, if we don't stop this, then nothing will be withheld from them. Nimrod, who was the grandson of Ham, who was the son of Cush, was the first world leader, and Cush is where all life sprang uh, in the world. Any objections to, to, to any of this stuff so far? Uh, um, no, because it says in uh, Genesis 10, 8, that Cush fathered Nimrod, who yeah. was the first powerful man on earth. Yep. It doesn't say in, it doesn't say in just a particular part of the world. It just, right. it doesn't say on this continent or in this right. area. It was on earth. On earth. He was powerful hunter. Yeah. Yeah. He was so the, Lewis. Yes, sir. So, Louis, the question is, um, so the facts that are undisputable are that Ham, and, and this is, you know, not debated amongst 
theologians, um, the sins of Ham populated what regions? Again, can you can you lay that out yes. for us? Yeah. So, um, and give me a second to pull up my Bible. Bear with me, Genesis ten. Okay, so the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Foot, and Canaan. Thank you. All right, let me show you this other map. This is important. This is important. This is going to help help you with. Uh, yeah, this, is, this will work. So again, those sons were Cush, um, Mizraim, which is Egypt. Cush is, Ethiopia is Greek, by the way. Ethiopia means land of black faces. That's Greek. Land of black Straight faces. Up. Okay. So, uh, but, but. Cush is, go start with Cush again. Cush is. Cush is the, uh, the father of what is now called modern Ethiopia or Ethiopia. So Ethiopians are Cushites. We have our word Ethiopia from Greek, which is translated land of black faces, but Cush and then uh, Mizraim, which is Egypt, Phut, P-H-U-T, which is Libya and Canaan. Now, uh, the map that I wanna show you here. So this is the geotectonic plates of that region. Okay. Uh, this is the African tectonic plate, the Arabian, Indian, Eurasian, Turkish, right? I want to show you that the African tectonic plate stretches all the way to Turkish Eurasia. Can you see it? Can you, you're showing it to us? Yeah. Oh, you can't see it? I'm not sure. Oh, hold on. No, sir. Hold on. How about now? Okay. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here, the bottom left is the African plate. Here, the orange is the Arabian, Indian, Eurasian, Turkish plates. You will note that the African tectonic plate stretches all the way to Eurasia, the Turkish, Eurasia and Turkish plate, okay? Who, this here, this stretch of land right here, this is the land of Canaan. Israel. The, well, from an yes. African perspective, Canaan. this is, this is Ham's youngest, this is, this is Ham's son, Canaan, right here. Now, in the next, in the next, uh, in the next couple of lessons, we're going to go in detail, go through in detail the table of nations. So we're going to be going through Genesis 10. Um, and it's, and so this is the land of Canaan. This is the land that God promised Abraham and his seed that they would occupy. Okay. Oops. Move. This stretch of land right here. Okay. Canaan is one of Ham's sons. And the children of Israel occupied this land. This is part of Africa. Israel sits in Africa today. The geographic location of Israel is in Africa. Okay. This is the African tectonic plate. All of that strip. So the Suez Canal or whatever it's called uh, is a man-made structure <laughs> to separate Israel, uh, the, the land of Israel from Africa, right? It is man-made. That is not a natural waterway. It's man-made because they don't want to be associated with Africans. Israel sits in Africa. Mm. Wow. Okay. All right. Now, what was the purpose of the Suez Canal? I, if, if memory serves me correct, Suez Canal was in, was an area, obviously right there where it is, where instead of going, that was a, a, a trade route. Yes. Was that not the case? Because that's, that, again, if, if memory serves me correct, that's that exactly right. Cool, the it, Suez it, Canal, it, instead of 
it was man-made so that they didn't have to go all go the way all around, around the continent continent yeah. and just and just so you're just saying country. though but you're saying though because they're not wanting to associate israel with africa yes and how so those are two separate things yep so here's, here's another thing to bear in mind what is mm -hmm. that region called today what is it called what you say after after they built the suez canal they anything the they anything did. west of the Suez Canal, they consider it to be the Middle East. The Middle East. The Middle East. Mm -hmm. Right. Not, not Africa. Not Africa. So you're, you're correct, Adon, in that the Suez Canal was um, strategically, speaking, it, was, it, was to, it was to simplify the trade route, just like absolutely. the Panama Canal. Yes. Right? But make no mistake about it, it was strategically placed. For the, for the purposes of being able to um, re-identify an entire, an entire region. So they're associating themselves with the Arabian plate. And not African. Yes. Not yes. African. Not the African plate. Yes. <clears throat> Great now, point, Lewis, Adon. here's Great a question. Point. Yeah, here's a question for you, though. Goes back to um, another argument that would come up since you talked about Eden. Um, Many people want to believe that Eden was originated in, since we're talking about the, the other tectonic plate, uh, Arabian tectonic plate over in that area. Right. Many people want to believe that Eden originated over in Mesopotamia. And that, and their argument was that the Tigris and the Euphrates River, they believe the original Tigris and Euphrates River sprang forth out of Mesopotamia. Yeah. We believe that the original Tigris and Euphrates River was in Africa. Um, I can speak to that. Yes, sir. Give, give me just a second to get to my notes. I know where you're going with that, Lewis. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and then I'll add some color. Well, I, I think I do. I think, um, I'm sorry. I think, wait, tell me what we're talking about again. My blunt mind just went blank, but I know what I was going to say. Eden in Mesopotamia, <laughs> Tigris and Euphrates River. Oh, uh, when when the uh well one of the things that i read during just looking up stuff was that when the ark landed when they got out of the ark they they named rivers after the names that they had known because they did not know that they were not in the same region necessarily no one something to that effect so they renamed they they named the rivers with the names that they knew but they were not the same rivers that they had been so I was, yeah. So I, I've actually not heard that. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. So here's here's what anthropologists believe about about these rivers. Give me a second. I'm, you know, all this works flawlessly when it, when it's just you, right? Uh, but as soon as you got an audience, uh, then everything wants to. Uh, now all of a sudden not work. Okay. Okay, this is, so y'all bear with me. Josephus um, gives it, huh? There's some background noise. I don't know if it's Wanda. Yes. Oh, okay. I don't know, I just hear some background noise. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Okay, Josephus gave an account. Okay, first of all, Josephus is a uh, Jewish historian uh, who lived in the, I want to say the second or third century. Second, he lived just a few years after Christ's death. He was born a few years after Christ's death. Uh, he's, he is a, a Jewish historian. Josephus gave an account of the rivers of Eden in his Antiquities of the Jews, where he implicitly located Eden. He proceeded to name each river, explaining the meaning and where he thought the rivers were located. Moses says further, Josephus speaking, that God planted a paradise in the east, flourishing with all sorts of trees. Now the garden was watered by one river, which ran about the whole earth and was parted into four parts, and Paisan, which denotes a multitude running into India, makes its exit into the sea, and by its Greeks called uh, Ganyes. 
Euphrates, as well as Tigris, goes down into the Red Sea. Now, the name Euphrates or uh, Frat denotes either a dispersion or a flower. By Tigris or Diglath, it signified what is swift narrowness, and Gion, i.e. Gihon, runs through Egypt and denotes that which rises from the east, which Greeks call the Nile. Okay, now, a lot of words. Here's what that means. He is not suggesting that those rivers moved, as one would think, um, by virtue of the flood. Josephus suggests that those rivers, uh, our, our translation of the scripture doesn't bear out what those rivers' actual names were. Now, I don't have enough time to go into how he goes, uh, how Gert Mueller goes through and demonstrates that one, we know that the ark landed on something called Ararat, right? And we know of an Ararat in Turkey, but did you know there was a mountain range called Ararat in Africa? And so, uh, and so it's likely that Jerry, that he did not name these rivers what he was yeah. used to because these were the very same rivers. Yeah, they will. It's 8.06, and I, I was afraid that I was going to I was gonna spend too much time trying to clear this up. I, I, I tell you what, what we can do next week is I'll pick it up from here and, and, and demonstrate, one, that those rivers are in, in Africa, two, that Ararat is not in Turkey, it's in Africa, this is going to be kind of scary. Uh, I didn't, so I'm, I'm going to say this because a man says it, but I'm going to study it out. If it's true, I'll repeat it or I'll prove it. If it's not true, then I won't. Can I give a spoiler? But the flood, the flood was, was local. Can I give a spoiler? Yeah. I just saw something just because I'm back and forth here as you're talking. Apparently, um, the Mount Ararat, in, where'd it go? Mount Ararat in, never mind. I'll tell you why I said never mind later. No. Okay. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong page, and I don't have time to look for the other one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, at the flood was local. It was a worldwide event, but the world, as big as the planet is, the, fl the flood stretched to all the peoples of the world which means that it stretched as far as people were populated and anthropologists suggest that the flood was local. It was worldwide. It killed all, everything that breathed air, but it was, it was rel relative to the size of the planet. It was local. It was the world they knew. Yeah, it was the world they knew. It was the oikumene or the known world as, as the word that's, that's being used. Uh, anyway, it's 808. I'll pick this up from here next week. Um, any questions about what we went over? So, number one, life sprang out of Africa. The Smithsonian testifies to that. Uh, the other scientific publications testify of that. The Bible testifies of that. Uh, common sense testifies of that. Evolutionists who believe that uh, that man evolved from apes. They also testify to that because the population of apes in the world is located in East Africa. And so Africa is where life began. Okay. Eden is in Africa. And because of man's sin and, uh, and, and everything, we know that God destroyed God destroyed the uh, the Oikumene, the known world. He destroyed the world. Hmm. Okay. All right. So is everybody, con and I'm just curious, just by way of um, responses, is anybody not convinced? And it, Lewis isn't done. He's going to go deeper next week. But is anybody not convinced that life began in Africa? Is anybody just, just honestly say, you know what, I'm not convinced. I think it started, I just... I, you know, based upon this argument today, I don't, I'm not convinced. I 
I, I'm convinced, but uh, Lewis, I got a suggestion. Okay. Are y'all hear me? Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime you use maps, especially if you're using different ones, you might want to get the dates. Because, oh, I have them. Because a person that can look at those two maps of Africa, because Ethiopia, Ethiopia was different on both of those maps. So a person could come back that that you just using something for your um, to prove my own point. And that's a great argument, Aaron. Uh, And here's one of the things to bear in mind about that argument: if anyone ever gives you that sort of argument, a hundred percent of the cartographers, a cartographer is a map maker, they're white. So I'm not proving. I'm not using my own stuff black people stuff to prove that no. black people you know what i mean i'm using yeah, no. i'm using their documented uh their, their i'm using their maps africans didn't make yeah. did are not the they're not using african maps or using european maps but yeah. uh I, I agree with you 100 percent. i should have been better prepared with that date and um exactly. and i do have the date as soon as i go back no, it's fine because yeah. if you got two different maps so, of the same, well, two di- two different maps. And you don't know, got the dates that one is older than the, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. It, it just looked like you just putting up some stuff to go over. Right. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, the other thing that we also understand is that things change over time. And so the territorial yeah. layout of the United States, right, is very different today than it was in 1492. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, um, but but thank you. I will absolutely be better prepared on those dates. I appreciate that. Hey, my second question: Does this scare anybody? Does does what Lewis has, what he shared with us, what he's revealed so far, does it does it scare anybody? Does it make anybody uncomfortable? No. No. Well, because I'll tell you initially when when. Um, and this is years ago. Again, I, I mentioned when I first started hearing um, Dr. Nash preaching about it many years ago at Mount Tabor, it, it made me uncomfortable. I, it made me very uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable. When- Can I ask why? Can I ask why? Man, because I had been, um, all the theology that I knew um, was Eurocentric theology. And, and, um, I'd been made to believe in all the images, you know, every Easter, um, I watched Moses, the, 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 the movie. And, um, and I saw those images and uh, I had a Jesus. My, my mother had a, a G picture of Jesus in my room, my bedroom as a child with a little lamb and little white kids around them and little and white Jesus. And so I, I was very uncomfortable having this, having this conversation guys. And so I'm just, Curious, is anybody is this is it like, whoa, you know, this really makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, I'm well I grew up I grew up having black Jesus and Moses in, in the house and everything. So it, it wasn't that's it's not uncomfortable to me because even now I still got pictures. I got the uh last supper with black with everybody black and stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. And, I see I see Q nodding. So Q, you had those same images? Yeah. <laughs> You're on mute. Yeah. So it, it and then I kind of used, when I was reading, I kind of used common sense on, I was good in geography when I was in school. So I was kind of using common sense growing up that you can't be looking one way, but the area today look totally, totally different you know, that's right totally different <laughs> you know so it uh, makes sense the the, the it, dots don't I connect never really, do i never really <laughs> i really never dug deep in it but in the back of my mind it, it never really made sense on how you know jesus was or not just jesus but like people in the bible was completely <laughs> white but the area, the land they in, was known for darker people. Yes. Yeah. I saw Stacy's hand too. Yes, sir. Um, 
to be completely honest, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I've always, even when I was much younger, I always asked mom, um, just being curious about the Bible and curious about biblical times and all that, um, I always question, mom, why, why were black people slaves? And so that, that always run through my mind. There was always, well, why them? Why are they so hated? Why are they so, you know, why are, why do, why is it the way it is, but it's towards them? So that's what comes back to whenever we first met with the, uh, about the subject at church on the Sunday, um, Sunday after you, you want to talk to this pastor about it, is that uh, whenever I brought it up to elder, I, that's what I said. I was like, well, perhaps that's why they're so hated. Perhaps that's why, you know, they were, you know, they were treated the way they were. And so that brings me to the, the I think it was a video um, that one of the guy, one of the musicians had sent me uh, about, uh, I don't, can't remember if it was Moses or somebody they were referring to, maybe Jerry remembers, but they were black. And I said, um, I wouldn't be surprised because of where it's located at in Africa. And so I, I'm not, it doesn't make me uncomfortable at all. I'm not surprised. I'm not. I might've been uncomfortable 10, 15 years ago, but. Yeah. Right. Not anymore. Yeah. And I've never been uncomfortable because I was sort of taught that from my parents um, that there was a, a little bit of the history that um, as a child that we, you see the white Jesus because when England came into power and the, and the Catholic Church, the Church of England, and they were trying to bring Christianity more to the Anglo, um, they figured they would follow a white Jesus before they would follow black. They knew Jesus was black, but they changed it. Oh, wow. But it was mm -hmm. to get the, to bring Christianity and get, get more of the Anglo um, um, folks to follow. It wasn't just to, wasn't just to get the Anglo folks to follow Jesus. It was, it was a, <laughs> it a was really designed. It, yeah, it was, it was designed to uh, um, place, uh, to justify white dominance. It, they used it to justify white dominance um, on, on the earth. Go ahead, Liz. I was just like to add to that, uh, and we'll talk about this as we go along. In, in 14 something, uh, Pope Alexander issued an, a, a bull, a papal bull, an edict that essentially was the beginning of what is now called racism. So common racism began uh, with a papal bull that suggested that everyone that did not, was not European, they were to, they were to take their lands, whoever they were, take, take all their possessions wherever they were, and then put the people in perpetual, ser perpetual servitude. So we gotta understand at this time in the 15th century, when the Pope spoke, it's as if God himself spoke. And he gave authority to the King of Portugal to go and do exactly, exactly that. Um, and it didn't, and it was, it was very much a political, Eurocentric white dominance thing. It's very much what it was. And we'll show this out. But another reason, Stacy, to your original question was why there's there's a couple of reasons. The primary reason is, and we'll like I said, we'll go over this stuff in future in future lessons. God had given the children of Israel promises of blessings and peace and power and authority, he had given them these, these, these promises. He had also given the Hebrew people um, the opposite of that. So if you don't obey, I'm gonna levy all these curses against you. And the biggest curse that Israel found herself in over and over and over and over again was idolatry. And God's not going to allow, tolerate, accept uh, us worshiping another God. He's just, that's just a non-starter for him. And, and the Hebrews, the children of Israel continued over and over and over 
to, uh, to disobey the Lord in worshiping and serving other gods. It's interesting, again, to your why, when you look at when you look at the curses, Leviticus uh, 16, Deuteronomy 28, when you look at those curses um, and then you try to imagine a people group in the world, as much as you know about people groups in the world, you try to come up with a group of people that identify with those curses. And um, well, there's only one group of people on the planet that identify with those curses. And that's the so-called African-American. Um, but like I said, we'll go through all of that in later studies and we'll prove that out. Um, but they're the only ones on the planet. Uh, I, have a, I have a coworker um, who is Jewish. His, uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's, a, he's actually become a very dear friend. And he's not religious whatsoever at all. Um, but every once in a while, he'll make reference. Yeah, we're scattered all around the earth. I'm in New York. I got a cousin who's in Russia. I, got that. I just smile and I just smile and sort of, yeah, yeah, I get you. <laughs> but the one thing about the Ashkenazi Jews, which again, we'll go over this in the future, is that they don't identify with any of the curses. The scripture makes it clear that Israel rebelled against God over and over and over and over and over again. In fact, when God sent them into captivity in uh, Assyria, it was because of their disobedience. Into Babylon, because of disobedience. That's it. Greek, That's it. Rome, all, all of their occupation from any other known power in the world has been because of their disobedience. So then when God says, up and into and including the New Testament and uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, where he says that you're going to be scattered across all nations, the, the, what we think of as Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, we'll talk about that uh, again uh, coming up, they don't identify with any of those curses because none of those curses were ever levied against those people as a people group. All right. Any other thoughts? And, and I I'm, I'm really appreciate you guys opening up and talking about how this may or may not make you uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable <laughs> seven years ago when I heard from a friend uh, who I know, a friend whose father was a racist, who he was raised a racist, who lives in South Carolina, who told me, Lewis, I think you are the Hebrews of the Bible. I think your people are the Hebrews of the Bible. And I completely dismissed him. Man, shut up. Jesus, we ain't gonna talk about nothing with Jesus. Race don't matter. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Um, and, um, but, you know, there was one passage of scripture that struck with me. I was, my dad had recently died. Mom and I were sitting in her den. I was reading through Genesis and she was reading through whatever she was reading through. And then Genesis 15, God tells, excuse me, Genesis chapter 12, I believe. God tells Abraham that his seed is going to be in captivity for 400 years. And I just did some quick math. Joseph went to Egypt, went to Egypt all right? They lived in plenty in the land of Goshen. They had, they were living, they were living their best life. Um, so 430 years, they were there total. They were in captivity for about 150 years. Now, 150 is not 400. Again, 430 is not 400, and God is exact. He said for 400 years. And I said, uh, Mom, and what do you think about this passage of Scripture? And she says, well, let me tell you something. And that's the first time my mom and I ever had that conversation. That's when things begin to that's when I began to ask questions. That's when I began to shed my discomfort for this subject <laughs> and began to just study it out. God told Abraham 400 years. Who, where, when, 400 years. And it wasn't Egypt, Egyptian captivity. So when. God's not a liar. So when. And um, so 
That's all part of the why. Sister Stacy. Good stuff, man. Good stuff, man. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we'll pick this up uh, same time next week. If you guys want to join early, I turn it on at 630. Um, you don't have to join early, but I do join it. I started at 630. If you want to test and make sure you can connect or whatever like that. Um, all right. Guys, um, la listen, last thing. Yeah. This again, this isn't beat up on white people. We're not we're not here to oh, beat up on no, white people. No, 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 no. All right. And no, no. And I just want to be clear about my about my goal. Uh I, certainly maybe at some point I wanted to kind of confront white people with with this information, but I really don't care to do that. My 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 focus is not to confront white people because again, for me to take that action to confront white people would mean I would need them to affirm the research and the the information that we have and 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 validate it and i don't need you to validate it it's 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 right i don't need you to say you know what pass by him that's true i don't need you to do that i know it's i know <laughs> i know it's true um this is more about people of color understanding that God is really serious and that we are living in the consequence of our, of, of idolatry. And, and we are living in the consequence of idolatry. And, and if we repent and, and, and turn that we can avoid these, this consequence. Um, and so that's really what this, what this is all about. This understanding we live in the concept also to all black people here in the United States of America, are not, and Lewis, he'll touch, he'll get to all that as he walks through this, the content. All black people are not, uh, or should not claim to identify with uh, being uh, Hebrews. All black people in the United States um, should not claim to be Hebrews, not all. Because in Africa, because there's lots of people that, that migrated from Africa that were of different um, um, tribes, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Lewis. That was eth ethnicity. Ethnicity, right? Um, but we do believe the vast majority of individuals that were traded in the slave trade um, came from a little place on one of the maps that Lewis will show called Negro Land, uh, tribe of Judah, in the uh, the slave coast of Africa. Um, and, and that's just, and again, those are maps that were written by white men, created by white men that were commissioned by the king and the queen to go out and do that stuff, yeah. right? And so this isn't stuff we just created with crayons. This is information that, uh, that we found. So, so anyway, so I don't want you guys thinking I'm, I'm black power tripping or anything like that. I'm not. I'm, I'm just simply saying, hey, you know, this the significance of this because if well pastor Brian, what does it matter jesus died for everybody well if it didn't matter they mm -hmm. wouldn't have changed if it didn't matter right. and you have a you have a, a group of people that historically anything that they wanted that was of value they they took they took it and they and they and they pillaged it and they and, and and they want that promise. Oh no, that promise, no, that's our promise, right? And they're gonna do everything they can to try to manufacture the appearance of the fulfillment of that promise, right? Even if that means enslaving a whole race of people to accomplish. It. So Aaron, the map is from uh 1798. All right. All right. Um, Good stuff. All right, all right, all right. Tanika, will you close us in prayer? Yes, sir. Will. Yeah.